I'm going to tell you, talk to you about Silimar and, um, and natural products uh, that grew out of our interest in hepatitis C uh, virology to find strategies that you could suppress the virus and suppress virus-induced uh, inflammation. So by way of overview, I'm going to tell you a little bit about hepatitis C, the natural history, the epidemiology, and disease burden. I'll talk briefly about past, present, and future therapies. Then I'll talk about uh, complementary and alternative medicine, really provide a definition for that, a definition of what a natural product is because people have different views about that. Um, then I'll talk, focus on Silimar and what it is, where, do you, where does it come from, and why do we study it. And I'll describe several studies that um, show its protective effects in cell cultures, including antiviral, anti-inflammatory, immunomodulatory, and antioxidant functions. And lastly, I'll show you uh, several pieces of uh, new and exciting data from our lab showing the effects of silymarin-derived mixtures on HIV. So this slide summarizes the natural history of chronic HCV infection. And upon acute infection, about 15 to 45% of people resolve their infection. But the majority of patients go on to become chronically infected. Uh, most people uh, do uh, have, are stable with this chronic infection. But up to 25% of people over 20 to 30 years will develop liver disease, including cirrhosis, that can lead to liver decompensation and hepatocellular carcinoma or liver cancer. And it's important to remember that life expectancy is estimated to be shortened by 8 to 12 years in an HCV-infected person. So the next slide summarizes the magnitude of the problem and uh, derived from approximate numbers on global death rates for the year 2003 taken from various sources. And on the uh, y-axis, you can see this is the global death rate in a log scale, uh, death caused by viruses or other causes. And you can see at the top of the list is HIV followed by viral hepatitis uh, secondary to hepatitis B and hepatitis C virus infection. And this slide demonstrates that hepatitis C is a global infectious disease. There is an estimated 150 million people who are known to be infected. And uh, the virus has a worldwide distribution. So for example, in North America, the prevalence is approximately 2%. Um, but if you look in long-term IV drug users, the prevalence of hepatitis C is upwards of 90%. Also, if you look in Africa, the prevalence is extremely high. And in particular, um, Egypt has the highest prevalence of hep C in the world. Uh, up to 14% of the population is infected. And this is a result of uh, improper uh, needle reuse during Shistosomani uh, eradication programs 20 to 30 years ago. And furthermore, there are six different genotypes of hepatitis C, and they all have a worldwide distribution, and the distribution of the genotypes varies depending on where you live. So, for example, in North America, the prevalent genotype is genotype 1. Um, it's also the prevalent genotype in South America, where there is an increasing prevalence of genotype 3. And then in Africa, there's primarily genotype 4, and genotype 1 is much lower prevalence. So there, there's also a disparity in the U.S. and I believe throughout the world in the way uh, we respond to HIV and viral hepatitis um, epidemics. So on the left-hand two graphs shows, demonstrates that in this country there are five times as many people infected with hepatitis C than HIV or HBV. And furthermore, the problem is magnified because there are a greater, far greater estimated number of people who are undiagnosed. They don't know that they are infected with hepatitis C. And from a funding perspective, um, both in terms of care, prevention, and research, HIV uh, dwarfs both hepatitis B and hepatitis C virus funding. And you can look at this another way if you look at the burden of chronic viral diseases in the U.S. So here's the four to five times higher prevalence of HCV than HBV and HIV um, in this country. And that translates into an estimated 193,000 deaths due to HCV in the next 10 years, uh, 1.83 million person years of life lost, and that uh, amounts to $11 billion in direct medical care costs, and up to $54 billion in societal costs from premature disability and mortality. So if you think it's bad, well, you should also think about this, that hepatitis C, because it's a chronic disease, 
is associated with development of liver cancer. And on the left panel here, these um, represents the all total cases of um, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma at MD Anderson Cancer Center between 93 and 95 and 96 to 98. And you can see that hepatitis C uh, associated liver cancer increased between 93 and 95 and 96 to 98, whereas hep B and other um, uh, inducers of hepatocellular carcinoma remain stable. And from a, a multi-center study led by Adrian DiBaschelli at St. Louis University, um, HCV was found to account for almost 50%, almost half of all liver cancer in this country. And the last pitch that I want to make um, of importance for hepatitis C is that um, the disease epidemic is, liver disease epidemic is really only beginning. So you can see here in the red line, um, chronic HCV peaked around 2001 and rates are going down because they're screening. But because this chronic disease takes 20 to 30 years to, to manifest, it's predicted that cirrhosis is going to peak in the next 10 to 20 years. So we're just um, in an emerging um, explosion of liver disease. And so because of these and other important clinical um, uh, facts about hep C and other viral hepatitis, um, the, the World Health Organization and many countries uh, proclaimed July 28th of this year to be World Hepatitis Day to raise awareness about chronic infections with hepatitis B and hepatitis C, as well as the acute infections with hepatitis A and E. And it, it even got some attention here at home. So the president is not only looking for jobs for everyone in America, but he's also doing other things and thinking about um, hepatitis. So he also proclaimed that July 28th was World Hepatitis Day. So chronic hepatitis C is a global disease afflicting 150 million people. Uh, many patients remain undiagnosed. The global disease burden is increasing, and this infection causes significant societal and medical costs. And the last important point is that the currently available therapies are extremely expensive. And when we think about therapies for hep C, um, we have to think about interferon alpha, which has been the cornerstone of therapy for hep C for the past 25 years. So this slide shows um, the, basically the evolution of interferon um, during this time. When it was started in 1986, it was given as a monotherapy. And you can see that that cured about 20% of all infections. And here we define cure as um, SVR, or sustained virologic response which simply means when you stop therapy and you look at a patient six months later, if they are negative for virus, that's considered a sustained virologic response. So you can see that uh, over the years, the interferon molecule has been uh, modified. It's been pegylated to increase its half-life when administered to people. Um, ribavirin is a nucleoside analog that's been incorporated into the therapy. So as of May 2011, the standard of care therapy was pegylated interferon plus ribavirin. And you can see that if um, this combination treatment cured about 45% of all patients with genotype 1, and it cured about 70 to 80% of patients uh, infected with HCV genotypes 2 and 3. So the question comes, uh, at least to me, is how does interferon work? And basically, interferon is an engineered molecule that is uh, all our bodies produce in response to an infection. And if you've ever had the flu and you have flu-like symptoms, it's the, that malaise that you feel is partly due to interferon uh, alpha. So interferon binds to receptors on, that are present on most cells in the body. It induces signaling through a pathway uh, called the JAK-STAT pathway. The details aren't important, but the key point is that, is that transcription factors get specifically activated by interferon. They go into the nucleus and induce expression of genes known as interferon-stimulated genes, or ISGs. So what interferon does, it induces an antiviral state in all cells. And because of this, it's a nonspecific therapy, and it causes a, uh, a wide array of side effects. The binding to the receptor causes signal transduction and leads to the induction of interferon-stimulated genes. And these ISGs are essentially the marines of the interferon system, and they carry out the antiviral effects by various effector mechanisms. 
So as um, hep C uh, virology has matured over the last 15 or 20 years, um, we've been able to understand and in quite detail various aspects of the HCV replication cycle. And so because interferon is, um, it only cures about half of all patients, it uh, uh, has a lot of side effects and it's very expensive, um, there's been a number of drug development efforts targeting various aspects of the virus life cycle. So first, I'd like to talk to you about these um, targets, but first I have to take you briefly through the HCV life cycle. So the virus binds to and enters cells. It, uh, the viral membrane fuses with an, with an endosomal membrane and it releases the viral RNA that is then translated by ribosomes to generate a polyprotein. The polyprotein is then cleaved into individual viral proteins by a series of cellular and viral enzymes. And the, these set up the viral replication complex that involves, that includes the NS5B, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase of hepatitis C that replicates the RNA, and um, some cellular factors such as cyclophilin A. Following RNA replication, the virus assembles and uh, is believed to bud through um, the, Golgi, um, the Golgi apparatus. So not surprisingly, because we know so much about these um, these aspects of the life cycle, that there's various uh, drugs in development that target each step. So there are entry inhibitors, there are, in, are inhibitors of translation, there's an inhibitor of the viral enzyme, the NS34A protease, they're trying to work their polymerase inhibitors, and there's various cellular targets to block virus assembly and release. I don't want to spend the details um, um, on, uh, on these pathways except on the NS34A protease because uh, protease inhibitors were approved for HCV this year. And this slide summarizes an example of the number of clinical trials that have been performed. This was called the advanced trial with the NS34A protease inhibitor known as telaprevir. And in this uh, study, um, over 1,000 patients who were treatment naive, infected with genotype 1, were, were treated with telaprevir in combination with pegylated interferon and ribavirin. So you can see that the standard of care therapy at the time, PEG, interferon, and ribavirin, cured about 45% of all patients. And then when PEG and ribo were combined with telaprevir for 8 weeks or 12 weeks, there was a statistically significant increase in sustained virologic response or cure rate. So these and many other studies led to in a, sort of a landmark or a paradigm shift in therapy for hepatitis C in May of this year with the first approval of the protease inhibitor from Merck known as uh, Victrellis or Bocepravir. And 10 days later uh, was followed by the approval of Insevec or Telaprevir uh, from Vertex. So the drug therapies for HCV, the very recent past, are, are pegylated, was pegylated interferon and ribavirin, but it's costly, high side effect profile. And many patients are ineligible for therapy because of their disease status. They can't afford it, they don't want it, or they can't tolerate it because of the side effects. The current therapy is pegylated interferon and ribavirin, plus these compounds called directly acting antivirals, or DAA compounds. And the first of this generation are the NS34A protease inhibitors. Um, there's probably going to be some compliance issues with these uh, DAA compounds. Um, it's already known that they cause unexpected side effects, and resistance is going to be a problem for these drugs uh, because they're targeting the virus and the virus can evolve um, away from the drug pressure. So the future will probably see second and third generation DAAs uh, that are targeting uh, multiple viral proteins and enzymes. Um, there are efforts underway to move away from interferon with combination drug regimens. There's a lot of effort directed at host cell targets. And I think uh, it's, uh, we can get into this later, but I think some of the work with Silimarin argues that it's targeting um, the cell. So this brings me to the point of, well, what about complementary and alternative medicine, botanicals, and natural products? How does this fit in with this sort of uh, FDA-approved drug development route? Um, well, we're working on it, but the reason this is that I believe this is important because um, people who have hepatitis C, they self-prescribe a lot of herbal medicines. And in this large um, uh, multi-center U.S. clinical trial, 
studying over 1,000 patients. They were, these patients were queried about their herbal product usage. And you can see that silymarin constituted 70% of the 60 herbals used at um, enrollment. So people are using these complementary and alternative medicines. And so what is uh, a CAM, or complementary and alternative medicine? And there is an NIH institute that studies this and funds people like myself to do this type of research. And so the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, or NCAM definition of a CAM, is a group of diverse medical and healthcare systems, practices, and products that are not generally considered part of conventional medicine. And this slide summarizes the 10 most popular uh, CAMs, and at the top of the list are prayer, but you can also see near the top of the list are natural products. And so this is um, from a sort of a reductionist virology, virologist perspective. This is where I think that we can make the most impact because these natural products are definable. And a definition of a natural product is a chemical compound or substance produced by a living organism found in nature that is, usually has pharmacological or biological activity for use in pharmaceutical drug discovery and drug design. And that's important, as we'll, we'll see later. So the reasons people take natural products are, there's really five major reasons. First of all, they're interested in trying something or something else. They believe that they will support conventional treatment. People are also skeptical of conventional treatments and also cost of conventional treatments uh, might uh, um, preclude someone from taking that treatment so they would turn to natural products. So back to milk thistle and silymarin. So what is, what is it or what's the history of it? Um, it's been described for centuries as a liver protector. There is reference in ancient medical and religious texts, and I was just looking at this today, there's a lot of reference to thistles in, um, in the Bible. And, but they actually weren't really viewed very positively. Um, but it's also part of traditional Chinese medicine, um, Kampo medicine in Japan, Ayurvedic medicine in India, and folk medicine in this and other countries. And because this is a, a, a CAM approach, it's sold, it's not FDA approved, so these um, uh, extracts are sold in the U.S. as a dietary supplement, uh, used as a tea or an oral capsule or, in some cases, a tincture. So when we think about the classification, at least phylogenetically, for me, it makes, it's, it's pretty simple. It's, it's a member of the plant family, and if you go down the family genus and species, the official name for milk thistle is Silibum marianum. But if you look in the literature, um, both the pop uh, literature as well as scientific literature, the, the nomenclature is not so simple. Um, milk thistle has a number of names, holy thistle, lady thistle, our lady's thistle, blessed milk thistle. It's got some, I think, some Latin. My daughter could help me with that. It's got some uh, Italian names. It's got some French names. It's got some German names and even a, a Chinese a name. So it, there's a lot of variation in uh, what milk, milk thistle is. But what it really is is this plant that produces these uh, pretty flowers. Um, and it actually is an, 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 it is an invasive weed, actually. It's a, uh, it's a class A noxious weed in Washington state because it can uh, cause uh, nitrogen problems in, in ruminants. Anyway, this is my, one of my great collaborators over the last several years, Nick Oberlees, who's a natural product chemist. And he, this was a picture of him in Jordan when this, I think, uh, silly marin uh, originated in Jordan. And you can see that the seeds uh, are derived from the flower when it dries out. So silly, silly marin is basically an extract from the seeds of the Silibum marianum plant. And it was originally thought that silly marin was a single compound. You make the extract and it makes you, it protects your liver and it's a single compound. But it actually has a very complex um, composition. And um, these are um, some HPLC chromatograms of the eight major components in silymarin. And they are all uh, flavonolignans uh, with a similar but distinct structure derived from the flavonoid taxifolin. And this is work that uh, Nick Oberlees and Tyler Graff in his lab, they provide us um, with the purified uh, natural products. So um, I don't mean to, actually, I do mean to be pedantic because um, there's a lot of uh, uh, misuse of the language for um, natural products, especially silymarin. So silymarin is derived from the milk thistle plant, 
from the seeds, you get an extract, and within the extract there are multiple natural products. And um, so then we started thinking about, well, if people have been saying for thousands of years that these things protect the liver, we wanted to um, uncover mechanisms of uh, hepatoprotection. So one way you can protect the liver is if you can prevent virus infection uh, of the liver. So several years ago, uh, we published a paper, and Jessica Wagner in my lab did um, the bulk of these studies. Um, this is a Western blot of HCV-infected cells um, treated with various uh, pr commercial and laboratory uh, standardized preparations of silymarin. And you can see that it suppressed expression of some HCV proteins, the non-structural 3 and 5A protein. And we, you can also purchase uh, rigorously standardized milk thistle from U.S. Pharmacopoeia, which is a major source of um, standards for this type of testing. And you can see that uh, silymarin caused dose-dependent suppression of uh, viral protein expression, but really didn't do anything to um, cellular proteins. So this is a small example of the extensive work we've done, and we've wanted to go back now to the life cycle and figure out where, um, where silymarin is impinging on the HCV life cycle. And I'm not going to go into the data because these have all been published, but we've shown that, the vir that silymarin and purified natural products from it can block um, fusion, it can block viral translation, it can block um, RNA production, and we also have some evidence to suggest that it prevents virus uh, release. And so you might think, well, okay, Steve, you know, this is laboratory medicine, and you're a virologist, and you work in cell culture, so what is this, you know, what's the clinical relevance of this? Is, this, is, there, any, is there anything to this? And the short answer is yes. Um, this is a study from Peter Ferenczi's lab in Vienna that came out a year after our publication where they um, took silibinin, which is a major component of the extract and consists of two compounds, silibin A and silibin B, that's been converted into a soluble version for intravenous um, administration. And this intravenous form of silibinin is used and licensed in Germany um, and other European countries for toxic mushroom poisoning. So Peter Ferenczi took these patients who were previous non-responders to interferon and, um, and ribavirin combination therapy, and he gave them daily infusions of silibinin for seven days. And you can see that, it caught, that silibinin administration caused log fold reductions in viral load in HCV-infected people. And the other uh, clinical validation is very interesting in the context of HCV and liver transplantation. Before I show, the, show you the data, I want to just remind you a few things about hep C and liver transplantation. So HCV, because of its high prevalence, is the single leading indication for liver transplantation in the U.S. and many countries. And furthermore, um, HCV-positive liver transplant patients um, have an increased rate of death and allograft failure. And this is because in almost every patient, when you give them a new liver, hepatitis C virus persists and it reinfects the new liver. So obviously, um, if you want to make hep C patients who get a transplant and live longer, you want to have th uh, therapies to prevent reinfection of the graft. And this is an example of a case report um, which has been validated in, by an independent group showing that after liver transplantation, pa patients were infused sil uh, silibinin uh, daily for 14 days. And you could see that that eliminated viremia, and patients remained um, uh, virus negative for um, almost six months. And that was associated with a reduction in liver enzyme values and uh, normalization of um, bilirubin levels. So there are some clinical, um, uh, you, there's clear clinical activity of silibinin and silimarin derived compounds, they inhibit HCV infection in vitro and in vivo. Because of our collaboration with uh, Nick Oberlies and Tyler Graff, who works in his lab, uh, Tyler can serve up these things and send us these purified components. So these are pure natural products um, isolated from Silimar and the extract. So we've gone on to, co to consider other uh, mechanisms by which you could protect the liver. And in this case, we are considering anti-inflammatory effects of silymarin-derived uh, natural products. And in this example, we looked at NF-kappa B transcription in a reporter gene assay. So NF-kappa B is a transcription factor that is, uh, plays a critical role in the induction of many, many pro-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines uh, that that induce, uh, produce an inflammatory response. 
So you can see here that when we treat cells with TNF, we can act to activate NF-kappa B, you get a, a good induction of reporter gene activity. And silibin A could dose-dependently inhibit this TNF induction of NF-kappa B. And silibin B could also have also had similar activity. Considering another possible mechanism of hepatoprotection, that of antioxidant function, we've also found that um, uh, the virus, when, uh, when hepatitis C virus infects cells in culture with this isolate, this uh, uh, infectious clone called JFH1, it induces oxidative stress, and this is just measured by um, uh, labeling cells with a redox-sensitive dye that becomes fluorescent when it gets oxidized. And you can see that, um, so the virus infection induces um, um, oxidative stress and that these, the individual natural pro uh, compounds as well as silymarin can block the virus-induced oxidative stress. And, but I, I didn't have time to uh, tell you about this, but some of these compounds down here are inactive as an antiviral. So you, you, you might say, well, okay, you block virus infection, so you're going to block virus-induced oxidative stress. Well, that's not always the case because compounds like silicrystin and isocilicrystin do absolutely nothing to the virus, but in this assay, they're blocking virus-induced oxidative stress. And finally, the other um, hepatoprotective um, activity that we uh, uh, consider is immunomodulation, which has a component of anti-inflammatory action. And these are data that were generated in collaboration with Jihiro Morishima and Minjin Chung. And what this is measuring is T-cell proliferation following ligation of the T-cell receptor with anti-CD3 antibodies. Um, and you can see that SIL in the black uh, rectangles dose-dependently suppress T-cell proliferation. And so SIL, I'm sorry, is the intravenous silibinin, and the natural uh, mixture of silibinin also suppressed uh, T-cell uh, receptor-induced proliferation. So we started putting all these things together. There's a lot of hepato protective functions of uh, silymarin, and we started wondering if there were any other applications, any other infectious diseases that we could, um, that where silymarin and related um, natural products might have um, uh, some activity. So we started thinking about HIV and HCV co-infection, and it turns out that a lot of people who have HIV also have hepatitis C. And um, this slide shows that in mono-infected patients, patients with HCV alone um, who become chronically infected, over about a 30-year period, they um, develop hepatocellular carcinoma. And cirrhosis takes about 23 years. But in the context of HCV and HIV co-infection, the chronic uh, progression to liver cancer and cirrhosis is accelerated. So in this case, hepatocellular carcinoma arises in about 17 as opposed to 28 years, and liver cirrhosis is greatly accelerated, requiring six to nine years as opposed to 23 years. So, so we thought maybe the effect of silymarin on uh, T cells may have some effects on HIV. And we were further, our interest was further piqued um, by this, uh, another publication from Peter Ferenczi's um, uh, clinical group um, showing a single case report of a patient with HIV and HCV co-infection. So what they did is they took this patient um, and put them on uh, intravenous silibinin for, for two weeks. And seven days after starting the SIL, there was a, a triple combination with pegylated interferon and ribavirin. And the peg riba was continued for up to, I think that's 18 weeks. It's hard for me to see on this. What's interesting here, in the first seven day, the SIL monotherapy, as before, SIL caused log fold reductions in viral load and had maybe a slight half log reduction in HIV levels. When uh, SIL was combined with pegylated interferon and ribavirin, the HCV, both the HCV and the HIV viral RNAs um, be went below the limit of detection. And when SIL was stopped, HIV um, climbed back up to the pre-treatment set point, whereas HCV um, remained negative, and the, the patient was eradicated of their hepatitis C virus infection. So we were very excited about our previous work and the study from um, Peter Ferenczi's group. And so we decided, with some help with Jessica Wagner in my lab in collaboration with Bob Coombs and Joan Dragovan, we immediately went into testing this intravenous formulation of uh, silibinin 
against HIV in PBMCs. So um, you can see that the virus control was uh, lots of virus coming out over this 14-day in, um, infection. And SIL uh, caused significant, uh, almost a logfold reduction in, or even greater than a logfold reduction in, um, in uh, um, a, uh, HIV uh, levels quantified. It was a P24 assay, but they quantified it as infectious units per mil. Jan uh, McClure then joined my group after we got some uh, UW Virology Division pilot project as a result of these preliminary data. And she wanted to validate this antiviral effect in multiple um, donor uh, PBMC preparations. And in this case, she infected both with uh, T-cell tropic uh, virus, um, LAI, which gets into cells via the CXCR4 co-receptor. And she also infected cells with a macrophage tropic virus, this BAL isolate that gets into cells via CCR5 co-receptor. And you can see that SIL treatment uh, caused several log suppression of LAI, and it also suppressed BAL. But the level of suppression uh, by, of SIL was greater for LAI than BAL. Uh, Erica Lovelace uh, then came into my lab, and she set up a... Um, a a, the TZMBL system, which is essentially a HeLa-derived cell line that expresses HIV uh, uh, CD4 receptor as well as co-receptors. And she infected them with, with various, with two infectious viruses of different clades and two pseudoviruses that um, only go through one round of replication of, of clade A and clade B. And you can see that SIL caused dose-dependent suppression of both the infectious viruses and the pseudoviruses in this uh, TZMBL system. And more recently, Jan has um, generated some macrophages from monocytes that uh, she has prepared and um, looked at the suppression of BAL, uh, which is a macrophage tropic virus in these cells. And she found very significant inhibition um, as measured as P24 antigen um, secretion um, by SIL. So um, HIV it seems to multiple types of HIV seem to be inhibited by SIL, and we also started wondering about the um, uh, virus-induced inflammation because when Hep C and, hep and HIV infect cells, it causes an inflammatory response. So in this example, um, Jessica Brownell, grad student in my lab, uh, together with Jan, they measured the um, production of the highly pro-inflammatory chemokine CXCL8 or interleukin-8 following LAI and BAL infection. And as you'd expect, this uh, chemokine was strongly induced by these two viruses. And SIL could uh, treatment not only suppress virus, but it suppressed the virus-induced um, inflammatory response. So um, in summary, HCV is a global disease. It has a high prevalence, uh, has very expensive therapies, and the disease burden is increasing in this country and throughout the world. And many HCV patients uh, self-prescribe complementary and alternative medicines. In particular, they uh, frequently take silymarin. And we've shown that silymarin and the silymarin-derived natural products display multiple hepatoprotective effects in vitro and in vivo um, by these various um, activities, including antiviral, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and immunomodulatory functions. And we've also um, are excited about these new effects of silymarin derived mixtures in inhibiting HIV. And this is from the intravenous formulation uh, we call SIL, which is um, silibinin, which is a mixture of silibin A and silibin B. And we've shown that it blocks multiple HIV isolates and clades in multiple cell types, including PBMC, macrophages, and TZMBL cells. So uh, in conclusion, silymarin's multiple effects may offer novel approaches to controlling viruses and inflammation in at least uh, three different clinical scenarios. We think there's some utility here for, for HCV mono-infection, HIV and HCV co-infection, and uh, liver diseases of non-viral origin. And that's primarily because of, primarily because of the anti-inflammatory uh, aspects of these natural products. So I'd like to take a few minutes and just try to pull this together for you to give you our sort of uh, working model for HCV and HIV. So the virus infects the liver cell or hepatocyte. Um, it in, through innate sensing um, and virus replication, you get production of reactive oxygen and reactive nitrogen species, which activate NF-kappa B, 
which um, produces inflammatory cytokines and chemokines. And this can lead, this inflammatory uh, response can lead to liver disease through various mechanisms, but ultimately you get fibrosis, cirrhosis, and liver cancer. And because hep C is a chronic infection, this inflammation is chronic. And there's a, a cellular immune component to this in that these inflammatory chemokines that are produced recruit immune cells to the liver, including T cells and NK cells, that become activated through proliferation. And they also produce inflammatory cytokines and chemokines that contribute to um, this liver damage. And we uh, have evidence now that silymarin is tagging a number of these um, inflammatory, um, the infectious event, as well as inflammatory sequelae. On the other side of the coin is um, how we're beginning to think about things in terms of HIV, HCV co-infection. So it's well known that HIV infects CD4 T cells. It activates them and it depletes them because it kills the cells. And what this does is it leads to uh, reduced um, immunity in mucosal surfaces. There is bacterial translocation leading to increased systemic LPS. And so this can activate um, both HIV-infected and non-infected cells. And this inflammatory response, um, it's very characteristic of HIV. Even people on um, antiretroviral therapy, that they, their immune systems look activated. And if you get uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells from them, the cells look like they're active. And so there's a, some immune dysregulation in HIV disease that increases includes the increases in this pro-fibrogenic cytokine, TGF-beta. There's increased hepatocyte um, uh, and lymphocyte apoptosis and increased oxidative stress. So we have evidence now that silymarin uh, can shut down, H, uh, suppress HCV as well as suppress HIV. And we're starting to think because of its antiviral activity that it, we may be able to target some of these immune activation, um, activation that's required for infection, as well as the uh, hepatocyte and lymphocyte apoptosis and oxidative stress. So the dotted lines here are, there are, are there because these are our hypotheses and we're actively working on this. So, summary, I'd like to thank the members of my lab, uh, Erica Lovelace, Jessica Brownell, Dennis Sorda, Jessica Wagner, and Jan McClure. And we've been really had fortunate to have great collaborators with uh, Chihiro Morishima and Minjin Chung here at the UW, uh, Nicholas Oberlees and Tyler Graff at University of North Carolina at Greensboro have been instrumental to us moving uh, this research forward. And the HIV work um, was initiated in collaboration with Bob Coombs and Joan Dragovan here at the UW. And Zane Kraft in Leo Stamatados' lab at Seattle Biomed helped us with an initial uh, um, pseudovirus assay. And funding uh, has been for the HCV story, as Jihiro mentioned. We just got an R01 to continue the um, Silymarin uh, HCV story. And the, the Department of Laboratory Medicine, I'm kind of an outlier because I you know, study viruses and I don't see patients, but uh, laboratory medicine has been extremely good to me over the years. And um, the Silymarin R01 actually grew out of um, a pilot award that we got from the UW Institute of Translational Health Sciences, this Pharmacy Ignition Award. award. And the UW Virology Division pilot award is actually what's funding our um, HIV uh, uh, growing project, and CIFAR has provided a little bit of travel resources. So we've been really fortunate to have a, a, a source of sort of local funding that we've then been able to translate into um, acquiring uh, larger uh, federally funded programs. So I'm very pleased with the way that has worked out. Reference to the, to the effect that it has in, in preventing infection. Has there been epidemiological investigations looking at because a lot of people already eat this? Is it does it is it expected to have any risk of reducing primary infection or vertical transmission from mother to child? So that's a great question, and uh, I'm just going to repeat the question: Is there any evidence that uh, oral ingestion of silymarin, because a lot of people take it, has any antiviral effects in people? And the short answer is no. And that's because um, when it's taken orally, uh, silymarin is not very bioavailable. Um, the uh, PK profile of these flavonolignans, these natural products, peak within a couple hours and they're gone with f within four to six hours. Um, so that's going to be obviously um, something that's going to need to be solved down the road. 
There um, are efforts using uh, various preparations of silymarin in a sort of like a phospholipid complex, which has uh, yielded the highest um, plasma levels of um, of these pure compounds or these uh, natural products in people. But oral, there's no evidence for oral administration in suppressing virus. So there's something about, um, you know, obviously when you're giving it intravenously, you can get much higher plasma levels. And we're, we're, the mechanism for how it suppresses virus when you give it intravenously is controversial. Can you talk about some of the possible possibilities of how it's doing it? Um, so the so we know that it inhibits uh, virus fusion. Uh, so a very early event when an, uh, the viral membrane fuses with an endosomal membrane. We've shown that in various experimental systems it blocks fusion. And um, HCV can also be transmitted cell to cell, and we've showed that it can block cell to cell transmission. And it inhibits viral RNA and protein expression. But obviously, if you inhibit something early and look downstream, you're obviously going to see an effect. We've also shown that it blocks virus uh, release, and that's from fully infected cultures that have never seen the drug. So we're at least, we're able to study a late event, and we can show suppression of a late event. There's um, one paper that's been published after our paper that said that it blocks viral polymerase, the NS5B polymerase in an in vitro assay. Um, we've looked at polymerase activity as well, and we can see suppression of polymerase activity, but it doesn't look like a really good um, polymerase inhibitor. You only get maximum inhibition of 50%, and you need very high concentrations to do that. So um, at least in a in vitro system, it's not a great polymerase inhibitor. So is it a physical sticking in two membranes or disrupting membranes, or is it actually cell surface receptor? Or do you have any idea? Um, I think those are all possible. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, we're actively, we, we think, uh, even though there is activity against polymerase in an in vitro system, it is my hypothesis that the, all of these activities, because it does so many things, is because it's targeting the cell. So we're actively working on um, using arrays and chemical proteomics and other approaches to define the cellular targets um, of silymar. And so the, there, it could be a membrane event, uh, could be protein. We don't know at this point. Yes, Pete. FDA is probably not known for approving mixtures as therapeutic agents. Is there any one component of this mixture that is looking better, or does it really look like there's some sort of synergism between all of them? Well, the, the CAM practitioners would argue, you know, you don't want to deconstruct the extract because the sum of the parts are greater than the whole. But as a sort of a Western-trained scientist, I know of no way to move this forward but then to look at one compound at a time. So we've played some games with, compound, with mixtures of compounds. And we haven't seen, when we've looked at individual compounds, we haven't seen anything that blows silymarin out of the water. But we have, there's a few compounds, like silybin A looks, is most active against most of our assays. And, um, and we've published that silybin A, iso A, and uh, taxifolin um, are, seem to be the most active across all the assays. The, um, the intravenous formulation is... Um, it's actually not a natural product anymore because they've had to, these compounds are typically insoluble in aqueous solutions, so you have to put them in an organic solvent to get them into solution. To make it into the IV formulation, they converted silybin A and silybin B into a succinate salt. So, um, and so, but it shows very potent activity in, in people, and it's, it's, there's a clinical trial ongoing here in the States for uh, mushroom poisoning, toxic mushroom poisoning, with this intravenous formulation. So um, I'm not sure I answered your question. Did I? Well, the question was sort of partly did, but are, is there any evidence for synergism other than well, this is the natural mixture or something like that? Yeah. So we we've done just a couple of you know combination. Um, experiments, and we haven't seen any evidence of synergism. But we see a few of the pure natural products, the single compounds, that um, seem to be as good 
as Silimarin, but nothing that jumps out of the water that this is 20 times, 100 times better than the extract. Keith. Steve, I'm interested in following up on the pathway forward to a, to a compound that, or a set of compounds that will help patients, not so much from a scientific viewpoint, but maybe from an economic business regulatory viewpoint. How does this go forward into something that will ever be FDA approved if presumably the intellectual property around this is pretty murky? Who, who would ever pay the enormous sums that, that this will actually take? Well, it's my view that I agree. The patent land, there's a lot of uh, uh, prior art on Silymarin, um, and you know the Center for Commercialization has helped me with a lot of um, this. So it's my view that if we can precisely define the cellular targets and show the interaction and define the structure, to me that's where the um, intellectual property is going to lie. And from that, once you have a, you know, a cellular target interacting with your compound, you can get a structure, you can start uh, derivatizing molecules. So that's where I think the intellectual property is going to be. Um, in terms of moving it, um, so, so I think that's, that's when we have some IP. Um, and if you think about therapies in, um, uh, you know, I don't know, how, I don't know how patients in Africa who have hep C are going to be able to get pegylated interferon and ribavirin and bocepravir or um, uh, uh, telaprevir. So um, I think that, there, so there's application I think is possibly an antiviral, but I think there's another important avenue is this suppression of inflammation because what's clear about hep C liver disease and HIV as I'm beginning to learn but we're new to HIV is that inflammation is what causes um, in it, it's the initiator and driver for pathogenesis so we may in, by pursuing this we have an option to suppress the virus and um, we already know that compounds that don't suppress the virus can block say, oxidative stress. So I think that there's also an anti-inflammatory component that might be, um, uh, that we could move forward. Chihiro. Have you looked at other viruses and their ability to infect cells? Um, we have not, so the question was, uh, I keep forgetting to repeat questions, um, have we looked at other viruses? Um, we've only looked at HIV. Um, we have in doing some of the pseudovirus assays, um, we had as a control, um, uh, I think our collaborator used an MLV, a murine leukemia virus, and that was also inhibited. So that argues that it's not a receptor, getting back to your question, Andy, that it's, it's, it might not be a receptor, at least in that sort of entry thing. So it could be a membrane um, type event. So, um, Mark. Yes. Great talk. Thank you. Has silymarin or its derivatives been looked at in other inflammatory or fibrotic disorders besides these viral infections? Um, well, there have, has been a lot of work on silybinin and silymarin in the cancer realm. Um, so silybinin, there's a ton of data that showing that it blocks proliferation of cancer cells, and it's actually, there's a lot of uh, animal model data and a lot of uh, cell culture based data that silymarin and silybinin have anti cancer effects. Um, and if you look at any other um, model of liver disease uh, in an animal model, um, silymarin and silybinin pretty much shut down uh, or they definitely block uh, liver um, uh, disease in, in pretty much any experimental model that's been looked at. I think it's been looked at like in ischemia, reperfusion, carbon tetrachloride. Um, so, um, but as for other inflammatory diseases um, other than cancer, um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank as for a specific one. Yes. So in the clinical trials uh, of brain and others, is there any evidence of an interaction or additive or statistic effect? Uh, no, one's, no one's looked at that. So the question was, is there any evidence that silymarin or IV-SIL um, in combination with the new protease inhibitors um, 
has any additive or synergistic effects. No one's looked at it, but I would argue that for people, not only the intravenous sill, that people who are taking these natural products, we really need to, the physicians need to be asking their patients what they're taking because it could, there could be some drug-drug interactions. And another question. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that the plasma levels are too low to be measurable. So presumably there's a first pass effect and it goes to the liver, it, it can, can either the drugs or their conjugates be identified in the urine? Is there a way to identify people who are taking Oh, them? so it can, it can be measured in, in, in serum, in, in blood. It can be measured, but it, it peaks and then it goes away pretty quickly. And that, there's been a lot of studies. Roy Hawk at UNC has done a lot of the oral dosing of silymarin and measuring uh, using mass spec, all these, um, these compounds. Um, so... It, can, it definitely can be measured in plasma, and it's secreted through the bile, so you can, you can find it in feces and you can find it in urine. So, yes, at the back. What is the longest duration of documented response so far? So that's part one of the question. And then part two would be, based on the data you showed me, if you're able to achieve HCV cure, that's great. You're off, you don't need it anymore, but in things like HIV, which are obviously a chronic process, it looks like sort of lifelong IV administration would be the option right now. And have we documented any problems with prolonged administration of the, your extracts at this point? Yeah. So I'll do the second question first because I always remember the first question by the time the second question comes. <laughs> Um, and if I keep talking, I'll, re I'll forget the second question. Um, the question was, uh, in the context of HIV, if we're going to go an intravenous formulation as an anti-inflammatory, this definitely would have to be um, uh, lifelong because, um, you, you know, uh, and uh, Keith is working on ways of, you know, getting the virus, uh, the integrated virus. So that would be um, the, the, uh, the ultimate way to go. Um, so the studies that I know of, they've at least with, so, and I think this relates to your first question about, you know, how sustained is the sustained response. In HCV, if you clear, uh, if you clear it and you're six months after stopping therapy, you're negative, 95% of patients are negative, and so they they're really are cured. And so I think the studies that Peter Ferency has done with the, the, the SIL monotherapy um, he is curing patients, and what's interesting is he's taking patients who were previous non-responders to pegylated interferon and ribavirin, giving them IV sil, and putting them back on interferon and ribavirin, and he can, he can eradicate viremia in these patients. So for that, it's a one-stop. For HIV, I think, you know, I, I don't know how long people have gone for, um, I, with IV sil. I think it's only, at, at most, a few weeks. Uh, that's certainly the case when they do it, uh, when they administer it for... Uh, mushroom poisoning.